Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Brad Hales. Uh, I'm most blessed because my daughter Abigail is in the back. She came with me. She's home from California for, for a month. By uh, She's going to get married at the end of April. And uh, her fiancé, our new son-in-law, is in the Marine Corps at Camp Pendleton out in San Diego. So, But she's back helping us with the wedding. So I usually have to travel alone, so it's pretty nice that I travel with someone. So, so let me go ahead and I'll begin with a word of prayer and then we'll talk. How's that? Father in heaven, I do thank you and praise you, Jesus. It's so good to be here at Trinity. Bless our time together, Lord God, as we talk about aging, that when we look at an aging church, we do not see one that is declining or going down, but we see aging as an opportunity for evangelism and outreach and renewal. Bless our time tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, uh, let me tell you who I'm at. I am the pastor of Reformation Lutheran Church in Call Pepper, Virginia, which is about, about three hours from here. You know, uh, there's two ways to get here. I could either take the Beltway in D.C. and go up 95, but I kind of like to go going up Route 15 in that way and that way. And so we did that. Um, in fact, my, my first church in 94 was here in northern Baltimore County. I, I was up in Sweet Air in Phoenix. So, uh, so we came early and showed Abigail, you know, the church because she wasn't born yet. And then we went to visit some friends. So, so I'm pastor of uh, Reformation Lutheran in Culpeper. Culpeper is basically halfway in between Washington, D.C. and Charlottesville, where the University of Virginia is. And then I also work part-time for the North American Lutheran Church that, that Trinity and my church is a part of. Um, so what I do is I focus and I help churches focus, help them with aging and evangelism and outreach. Because a lot of my ministry has been, I've had three calls in almost 30 years. What I do, I go into churches that are hurting and help them to renew and help them to grow. So I work very part-time for the North American Lutheran Church. I go across the country. In fact, two weeks ago, I was in Fresno, California. I go across the country, and I talk about aging and renewal. So Pastor Jay told me that I could come today, and hey, I get to drive here, right? I don't have to get on a plane. So, so it's a really good thing. So that's why, that's why I am here today. And uh, hey, the way that I do this, I want you to talk. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand. This is, uh, I'm not going to sit here for the next hour and lecture to you. Okay, because it would put me to sleep myself. So please, please talk. Please share what's on your mind. Okay? So what I want to do is talk about aging. Talk about aging. Because quite frank about it, most of our churches in the Lutheran Church are aging at a rapid rate. They're aging at a rapid rate. More middle-aged people, more older people. And one of the reasons that they're aging so rapidly is because the world we live in is aging very rapidly, isn't it? Let me, let me give you some stats. For example, in, in 1900, in 1900, only 6% of the population was 65 and over. In 1900. By the time we get to 2060, which, you know, which is only about, what, you know, about less than 40 years from now, almost 25% of the population in America will be 65 and over. So that means in a, in a country that will probably have close to 400 million people, almost 100 million people will be 65 and over. And that's by 2040. Now, for example, Abigail back there, who is at 22, 23, in 40 years, she'll almost be there. Right? So we know that we're aging at a rapid rate. And here's a couple of reasons why. First of all, less people are having babies. Okay, and it's just not here. It's all over the world. In fact, there are places in Europe, like uh, Japan and Italy and places like that, that they're even aging faster than we are in the United States. Because there are, the, the birth rate is lower. Then the other thing is, you know, we've been taught the population is going to keep getting bigger and bigger in the world. Now they're changing some of those estimates, and they realize that the population is beginning to decline. 
or will decline in the world. So basically you have, you have less birth, you have population decline, and guess what? We're all, we're all living longer. So what that means is that you see the world population aging at a rapid rate. Aging. So um, just put some quick facts on there. Every eight seconds in America today, somebody turns 65 years of age. Every eight seconds, which means roughly over 10,000 people a day in America turn 65. And a big part of that certainly has been the baby boomer population, right? Those born between 1946 and 1964. About roughly 78 million people. So, you know, we see this great aging in the country. Every 67 seconds, somebody now is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Every 67 seconds. Now, there's about uh, 5 million people um, that, that, that's been documented with Alzheimer's, but within the next many years, that's going to quickly go up to about 16 million people. And that doesn't, didn't take into account the care that folks will need and, and how that affects families. Uh, I think the next stat to me is really the one that, that, that gets me all the time. By 2035, which is only about 12 years from now, there are going to be more people 65 and older in America than 18 and younger. In just 12 years. There are going to be more people 65 and over than 18 and younger. That's pretty staggering, isn't it? When you think of a country like the United States, it was young and youthful, right? Uh, we've talked about by 2060, almost a quarter of the population will be uh, uh, 65 and over. I just read another stat you might be interested in uh, on falls, because you know with older adults, falls are a really big thing, right? I mean, that can be very devastating. Now we know every two seconds an older adult is falling. Every 11 seconds an older adult has to go to an emergency room because they fall. And every 20 minutes an older adult dies just because of falling. And we know that the average Lutheran in most Lutheran congregations is 60 and over. And in some churches it's way over 60. Now, here is the question. Because we have such an aging population in our country and in the world and in our churches the question is, as the church, how are we going to respond? Right? A lot of churches, unfortunately, will say, we're getting older, less people are coming, so the church is going to die. I hear that. And I see that. Well, guess what? I'm a renewal man, so I don't buy that. At all. I don't buy that at all. I say... When I walk into a church with older people, they think I'm crazy, but I see that as a gold mine. When I walk into a church with more middle-aged people and older people, I see that as a gold mine because I see this is a great opportunity for evangelism and outreach. If I, would, if, I would ask the, if I would ask the usual pastor, I said, in the next 40 years, there's going to be 100 million people more that we can do evangelism with. They're all going to say, yay, yay, yay. And then when I tell them they're people over 65, they say, oh. Yeah. Right? I sometimes get that response because the problem is we see aging, a lot of people do, and we see decline and we see death. Well, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. So, about 18 years ago, I was, so I spent three years here in Baltimore. I spent uh, eight years up in upstate New York. Anybody ever hear of Rome or Utica, New York? You did? Griffiths Air Force Base. So our church was down on Route 365 going toward Oneida. Okay. That direction. Okay, so now where the Turning Stone Casino is. Right there. So, so I really felt my work was done there. The church grew great. It was a nice renewal. So, so 
We wanted to move more south because my wife had a sister and our family was in Arlington, Virginia. So we've been coming down through years. So I put my paperwork into the Virginia Senate back then and they said, well, we have this little church we want you to interview with. Uh, they don't have a building. They worship in a converted funeral home. Would you go talk to him? And I said, sure. And this was a church of about 30 people, over 60, right? Now, most people would run away from that as fast as they could. I said, this is my opportunity. This is what I like. So we went right now. It had some really good interim pastors that, that came before me. And, and, and what was happening is this church had broken away from another Lutheran church in the 1980s. And it probably left with about 50 or 60 people. But by that time all the teens and children had left. So we're down to about 30 people a week in this converted funeral home. And everybody was over 60 now. The pastor and interim pastor said, said to them, look, you should really look at senior ministry, older adult ministry, because in Culpeper, there were huge Baptist churches, there were huge Methodist churches, there were huge non-denominational churches, they had gyms, and it was very clear, since my children were the only children there, that we weren't going to do youth ministry. <laughs> but what was the asset that God gave us to do ministry with? Aging. Aging. So we ended up centering the ministry around aging. And people told me I was crazy. Oh, the church is just going to die and it's going to die. Well, guess what? We started an, ec because no other church in town was doing aging, right? So we started an ecumenical aging ministry and these things, right? And let me tell you today, let me tell you today, this little church, right, in 18 years, we've been in four rental units. We finally, we finally bought our first building in 40 years. We actually bought a building now for the future of the church, right? Here is a church now that worships 240 people a week. And guess, guess who's still the main people coming and being a part of this church? Aging. Middle age and older. <laughs> Middle age and older. Because I was always told, you can't, you can't revive a church like that. Right? Because people are getting old and they're dying. Because here's the fallacy. Sometimes people think when somebody is older, they already know Jesus and they're already connected with the church. Guess what? They're not. Many times people are older, they've not had that relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe they've gone from church to church and they've never settled on one. So we continue to see, and now Culpepper, uh, Culpepper has become a retirement community, kind of like a first-rung retirement community out of D.C., and people from the north, you know, for some reason, people didn't like to stay living in upstate New York because of the weather and the taxes and things like that. So, you know, people continue to move down, and so that's what we're seeing. This church that once had 30 people, we focused on older adults, and it is a growing and a vibrant church. So when people tell me that you can't renew a church through older adults, I don't agree. Because that has not been my experiences. But one of the first things we have to do when we talk to congregations that are aging, and by the way, people ask me all the time that they say, did you abandon anything with children and youth? Absolutely not. We know we still did youth ministry. We still had a little Sunday school. We still did vacation Bible school. In fact, our Sunday school is growing today. And you know why it's growing? Because the grandparents are bringing their grandkids and their great-grandkids to Sunday school. And to church. Many of our churches are getting older. They're aging. So the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Are we just going to say, this is the lot, we're going to deteriorate or we're going to die, or are we going to say, look, with aging, we have a gold mine? Because so many people are getting older. How can we harness that? How can we harness that asset that God has given us for ministry and use that for outreach and evangelism and help older adults grow in their discipleship and in their faith with Jesus? So tell me your thoughts initially. What are your thoughts? Don't be shy. Yes. I, I, don't, I would think with this 
with this subject that you, mm -hmm. I would think as the old timers get gone, you would need younger people to come in and fill the gap. I would think that. I think we do. But guess what? There's a lot more old, old timers. That are people are getting older and middle aged. And that's why I always said we, we, did not, we did not abandon reaching out to children and youth. We still don't do that. We still reach out to children and youth and families. But when you see how fast the country is aging and realize, I mean, 20, 35, 12 years from now, there are going to be more people over 65 than below 18. And I'll tell you what I see in the church. I, I see yes, less younger families come into the church and I'm seeing more middle-aged and older adults wanting to grow in their faith and connect with Jesus. So, yeah. I want to describe a profile to you and tell me if, if that is common or uncommon. Uh, I went to a Lutheran school mm -hmm. and up until 10th grade. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I was 17 or 18, discontinued going mm -hmm. to school to sure. church and actually discontinued anything related mm -hmm. to religion in large part. Went back at 48. Sure. Yep. Yep. And said, okay, you know, uh, I just felt something was missing in my life. And then yep. and I knew what it was, but it just it took me a while to get there. And so you had almost this 30 year gap. Yes. And is that yes. common? Yes. I see a lot of middle-aged and older adults coming because things happening in their lives and they want to reconnect with faith and the church. It's very common. And to be quite honest with you today, you know, I was, I was talking to Pastor Jay at dinner. I mean, I was ordained in 1994. <laughs> you know, people were still going to church a lot in the 90s. When I was ordained, I, I was laughing because when I was up in Sweet Air, and you know, that's been a, that's a fast grow area up there. I was there from 94 to 97. Within a three-year span, the church attendance at St. John's three, Sweet Air, that country church up there, went from 220 to 350 people a week in three years. That's a lot, isn't it? I had never experienced that kind of growth. So people were still going. There was an interesting, there is a, there's a research company called Lifeway Research. Uh, it's connected with the Baptist Church. They did a survey of worship attendance from 2000 to 220. And they stopped their research right before the COVID. When they started, the average worship attendance in an American church was 137 people a week in 2000. By the time we get to 220, 67. And that doesn't even count. That has no connection at all with the COVID-19 pandemic. It had fallen that quickly. You know, young families, they're busy, they're working, they're, it's baseball, football, it's everything. They're doing all their work on Sunday, they're shopping, they're doing the laundry, aren't they? It's true, right? You know, for so long, we, we want to fight against that, and we want to fight against that, right? Well, you know, people don't want to go to church anymore. Instead of fighting against that, why don't we be open to the people who want to come, who are seeking? And more and more, we're finding that to be middle-aged and older adults. And trust me, they need to hear about Jesus too, don't they? And get into that relationship with Christ. Other thoughts or comments? I know, I knew this might seem foreign concept. Because we have been taught our whole lives the, the most important motto for evangelism in the church has always been to young families. I get that. We honor that. But as the population greatly changes in America, can we say, look, we have this whole mission field and why don't we design ministries to reach out to people that are aging so they can know the love of God and Jesus like we do? Thoughts or comments? It, it strikes me almost, I hate to use a purely marketing analogy, but, you know, if you have, you know, oh. 15 companies all providing the same service, and you have a demand for service that none of them are providing, how are you going to be easy? You can look all this video, right. you can look at sales, because it's right. people are big, but you're not going to be able to break into that market. And if, if ministries can work the same way, if there's ministries out there, and other things are being met by other churches, yes. this need is 
not, yes. that's where you can best serve Christ. You know, I, I appreciate you saying that, Keith, because, you know, I've, I've uh, um, even when we were still with the ELCA before, you know, uh, 11, 12 years ago, we moved to the NALC, I actually was working part-time with the Virginia Synod. They, they had called me part-time as their congregational transformational renewal guy, right? So I would go across the state of the Virginia, and I don't live too far from the Shenandoah Mountains. I'm sure you know where those are, the Blue Ridge. So, and there's a bunch of little, little Lutheran churches up there, right? And I would go, and I would talk about aging, and they would look at me, and they said, oh, pastor, that's really nice. And he's had like 15 people in him a week, right? That's really nice, but we got to reach out to youth. All we have to do is hire a youth director, right? And that's going to change everything. <laughs> you know, I, I heard that time and time again. Here, here, here's always been our problem in the church. We ask the wrong question. The question we're always asking is, if we had, we could be. We're always saying that. If we had, we could be. I want to change that question around instead of if we had, we could be. How about look what God has provided us to do ministry with and that's what we're doing ministry with. Do you see the difference in the question? If we had, we could be. Look at what God has provided us to do ministry with and that's what we're going to do. Other thoughts or comments? I guess the other, the other side of it would be what we have, let's do. Yes, let's do. Because to me, to me, what we have is an asset and a gift from God, isn't it? He must have provided that for a reason, right? Yes. All right. Let's go on. Here's a nice scripture here, Proverbs 16.31. Gray hair is a crown of glory. It is gained in a righteous life. You know, now, hey, now people go to, to beauty salons to get gray hair. Don't they? To get their hair colored gray. That's a big thing now, isn't it? <laughs> we don't even have to do that, do we? It's natural, right? All right. So, when we think about aging ministry, aging ministry, what might that look like in a church? What, what, what might they look like? And, and what's really important to us is the church and then the North American church, Lutheran church, is something called life-to-life -life discipleship, right? We want to help people grow in their faith and their relationship with Jesus, don't we? And it's the same with older adults. In fact, I find older adults even more hungry to grow in their relationship with Jesus. And we're going to talk about it. Why? Here's the first reason why. You know, when we get older, life might be ending more quickly. Right? We get older, you know, we have to deal with things and life might be ending more quickly. And as people get older, they want to know where they're going to go when they die. Don't they? They want to know, you know, not that uncertainly, but where are we going? I mean, what do we believe in? And that's one of the reasons why we should be reaching out to older adults, right? Because we can share that assurance and that grace of God in Jesus Christ that through that free gift of faith, we know where we're going, aren't we? We're going to live forever with Jesus. So that's really important, isn't it? Right? That we share that good news with people. You know, as people age too, something else that's very important on their heart is meaning and purpose and legacy. Because as we age, people want to know, has my life been worth it? What have I done? What's been important? What kind of legacy am I leaving behind? We can help people with that, can't we? In the church. As they age. You know, it's interesting. I used to, in New York, I used to, uh, every quarter I would, I would take the older adults on what I would call a word retreat. Word retreat. We'd go to a local camp. And we'd spend the day reading and talking about the Word of God. And we'd have lunch. And I'm telling you something, I have never seen more passion than people studying the Word of God. And they're not interested in a bunch of books that tell them about it. They want to open up the Bible. And they want to read it and know God's Word for their lives. Let's face it, as we age, we have more sickness and health concerns, don't we? 
you know, and maybe caregiving concerns, right? And we got to take that into consideration as we help people grow in their faith that that's what they're dealing with, right? Sickness and health, the body is changing. You know, we certainly saw this during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially for older adults. So much more loneliness and isolationism. Loneliness and isolation, I mean, because that was kind of forced on us, right? Because of the, the illness and everything and the, and the virus. Is that, do you know how many older adults are lonely and isolated on a regular basis? And who could be the one in the community to really reach out to people that are lonely and isolated and do a ministry with them? The church. The church. Right? Here we are. We're all set. You know, it's interesting. In this electronic age where we all many use phones and devices and things like that, isn't that amazing? The church can be that physical presence of God that we can welcome people in, right? To help them with lonely and being isolated. Passing on the faith. That's huge, isn't it? I told you earlier about my Sunday school, right, at my church. It's grown because the grandparents are bringing their grandkids. Not their parents. You know, how many, times, how many times have I heard this from parents? Pastor, I don't understand. I raised my adult children in the church. And now they don't go. Then they're, they're, I hear that all the time. They're saddened by that, upset by that. Then I say, do you have any grandkids? Because you know what? We have a prime opportunity now for you to share your faith in Jesus with your grandkids and your great-grandkids. Years ago, I actually had a great-great-grandmother that would bring her granddaughter to Sunday school in church because she thought that was really, really important. And do you realize we may be the only ones as we age to pass that faith on to our grandkids and our great-grandkids? Service, you know, for a lot, of, a lot of older adults, they got a lot of time on their hands sometimes, don't they, if they're not caregiving, right? And if it's not for older adults, who else is serving? You know, you go to any nonprofit in a community and you ask them who their volunteers are, you know what they're going to tell you? Older adults. They're big, big, big capital, isn't it? And that's the same with us in the church, right? We have people that can give of their time. Now, now there's, a, there's a term out there. Have you ever noticed any older adults who like to say, well, I've, I've volunteered enough in the church and I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to let the young ones do it, right? There's actually a term for that. It's called rocking chair theology. <laughs> rocking chair theology that, oh, I'm not going to do anything anymore. Let me ask you a question. Where in the Bible does it talk about retirement? Can anybody tell me? Retirement in the Bible. In all fairness, there is something in the book of Numbers because if you were a priest, a priest, you could only serve from 25 to 50 and you had to give up. However, though, your work wasn't done because at 50, you had to train the younger guys and you had to keep watch at, at the entrance of the tabernacle. So actually your work wasn't done, right? It just changed. There is nowhere in the Bible that it talks about retirement, is there? Zero. In fact, I don't like the term retirement. I like the term refirement. Because as we age, we keep getting refired and we get called to be involved in other ministries and different things, right? No retirement in the Bible whatsoever. Um, how about, uh, we talked about that, so I have this little acronym that I use for aging, and you know, you know, like cheerleaders go rah, 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 right? I have a rah, rah acronym for aging, R-A-A, -A, Relationships, Attitude, and Activity, Relationships, Attitude, and Activity, rah, rah, right? Because the more as we age, we have relationships, we keep being active, and we have a good attitude, do you know we, we age better? We age much better. Thoughts or comments so far from this list? What are you thinking? What's on your mind? I think we're going to see a lot more loneliness and isolation in 30 years from our teens. Yes. Those who are basically have relationships with their phones. And so I don't know, how do we train folks to, to do that? Because I, I can't imagine phones are going to disappear. No. 
so is there, yeah, I mean, how do you, because we now have kids that don't know anything but the internet. I mean, yes. Well, look at Abigail. They know no different. Right. They know no different. She, Abigail, Abigail was born in 2000. Mm -hmm. 2000. They know no different, do they? It's different if Y2K would have blown the whole world up. Well, that's true, and then we wouldn't worry. But yeah, so. but yeah in 40 years, she's going to almost be 65. You're right. I think, I think that is one of the ways we as a church need to get out there in a the community saying, we're actually physically here building relationships. We're here aren't we? And I think that's one of the gifts we had. I think all of our churches, we should focus on that for outreach and evangelism. We're here. You're looking for a relationship. You're looking for a community. You're looking for a place to come. We're here. You don't have to just, you know, always Google us to, to you know, yeah, you can watch online, but we're physically here, aren't we? We want to be in relationship with you. We want to come to know you. I think that's going to be huge. I do. Other thoughts? You referenced uh, young people um, like our children, sure. my children, sure. uh, not being involved with, mm. with uh, the church. And I, I think part of it is that they have no concept of rest. Good point. That's an excellent point. Their idea is I'm working, you know, there's men, several of them are on. Um, almost like a 24-7 yes. call. You know, I mean, they're hooked in and working at least five and a half to six days a week. Yep, and always on because of the electronics. Yeah. Right, it's true. They're, they're linked up. True. And, and working from home 90% of the time. Yes. So, but they don't know how to sit back and read a book and relax. You're correct. I, I just, it's, I, I marvel, I just say, I couldn't live that life. Right. Oh, and think about it. Why do you think we have more anxiety in the world? Why do you think we have more depression in the world? I think a lot of that is because of the elect. Obviously, there's many other reasons, but I think electronics has been a, one of the causes to that, hasn't it? Because you're right, we never slow down, do we? We do not. Well, you know, and I always like to say, God, God rested on the seventh day, didn't he? We don't all the time, do we? Yes. So another thing we have to take into consideration with older adults is going to be more grieving in death, isn't there? We get older, you're dealing with grief, right? You're dealing with death. You know, and that's, that is very important, I think. Pastor Jay, I think you told me since you have been here, you have done 90 funerals. Since Pastor Jay's been the pastor here, 90. That's a lot. That's a lot. Right? And there's, there's grief and there's their thing. You know, and middle age too. I don't know if you know or not, but a lot of middle age people are dying younger too. I mean, unfortunately in my own family, my wife's older sister at 56 this fall died of metastatic breast cancer. At 56. We're dealing with it, right? And the church can be that place to help people. You know, in dealing with that grief. Uh, one of the big ones, loss of independence, right? That's a biggie, isn't it? That's a bad one, right? What do you fear most in loss of independence? Well, I think it's uh, hoping that they're going to have self-driving cars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great point, isn't it, right? Uh, loss, loss of mobility. Let's see. Loss of mobility, loss of driving, loss of maybe getting to live in your home, you know, loss of relationships. Can, how many times would I have had older adults tell me all my friends are, have died? You know, I could go through that list, right? It, it, it does give you some idea as to, well, how long do you really want to live? But true. <laughs> true. If everybody is you're leaving, if you're leaving, you know, if you're, you have no Mine. peers or no, no, no friends. Right. Because they're all gone. You're kind of like, oh, geez, I don't know that I want to be the last one. But, you know, the question is, how can a church think of a ministry, Right. Can we help transport people? You know, do, can we help feed people for older adults? Can we provide other worship services during the week for them, right? You know, everything I'm lifting up here, the church can be creative. And see, and these are ministry opportunities, right? That we can reach out to older adults. You know, one of the things we did because we were finding them, we actually started a midweek worship service. You know, every Wednesday, I do a half-hour communion service at noon and 7 o'clock. You know, sometimes I get 30 or 40 people at noon. 
the people that do not come on Sunday. That's their worship service. We always make sure that all the materials are in large print. You know, because we're aging, right? Hey, this pastor needs large print. I got my reading glasses in my pocket. You know, I need that, right? It's just some of the things you're thinking. How, as we're looking at all these issues, how, how are these ministry opportunities for the church to welcome older and middle-aged adults in? To come to know and grow in Jesus. Obviously, caregiving is huge. You know, more people, more people are having to be caregivers, spouses, uh, children. Uh, you know, there's interesting. Have you heard there is a, you know, I'm sure you've heard the term before, sandwich generation. The sandwich generation, you have maybe a middle-aged, middle-aged folks having to care maybe for children and then their parents. Now there's something called the triple-decker generation. Here's a new one. Caring for children. Parents and their adult children have moved home. You know, tell me about almost 30% of adult children, 20s or 30s, live at home now. It's really growing, and that's a whole new dynamic, isn't it? So that's, that's cool. So, I mean, caregiving, I mean, I mean let, me, let me throw some ideas out here, and you may think they're crazy, so I know of churches that have nursery schools and schools. You know what else that they have in their churches? Adult daycares. How do you like that? They do it. It's a, hey, I think my, my good friends, the Baptists down the street did that. They just did that. They turned, they've had this 40, 50 year daycare and now what they're doing is they just started for children and now they have an adult daycare. And so that's really intergenerational, isn't it? Because you have the children and adults. I've known churches that do that, use their space. That's a great use of space, isn't it? To welcome older adults in. I mean, uh, any caregiving support groups, any, any training for caregivers, any, um, any respite. You know, that's sometimes we've done that. We've also respite so a caregiver can come to a caregiver support group, but there's respite here that they can bring their loved one because if they can't do that, maybe they couldn't come to the support group. You know, any of those things. Caregiving, caregiving. Uh, I once heard a stat the other day. You know how many un, unpaid caregivers there are in this country? Millions upon millions. And for some caregivers, some children are forced to leave where they're at, leave their jobs, and it has caused financial hardships to be able to care for their parents. Prime example. My mother is going to be 86 years old. She lives where I grew up. I grew up in northwestern Ohio, west of Toledo. Do you know where that is? I live. If you, if you look at the little corner, northwest corner of Ohio, I grew up in that corner. 10 miles from Michigan, 40 miles from Indiana. So I grew up in that corner. Well, my mother still lives in the house that I grew up in. So she's lived there now with 56, 54 years in that house. Now, my dad, unfortunately, died of metastasized colon cancer young. He was only 68 years old. So my mother has been a widow now for almost 20 years. 20 years. See, she doesn't want to move. That's her independence, isn't it? Would we like her to move out with? Yes, we'd love for her to, but she's not going to do that. I mean, she's lived within a 30-mile radius for 86 years. You know, her family, her, her, some siblings are still there and everything. So one of the things we did, because she had had some health concerns, you know, and some problems, we actually hired, we have a caregiver that comes to her house three days a week for two hours to help bathe her, to help her clean. Right now, some days, the great thing is both she and Vicky are very stubborn and strong-willed. And about every six months or so, my mother calls and says, well, I want to fire Vicky. And I said, if you fire her, I'm going to hire her right back. Because we need her. Don't we? Because I live in Virginia. My sister lives in Chicago. My sister's a little closer. There is no airport. We can fly into Toledo anymore. So whenever we go, we're either going to have to drive in. For me, it's 10 hours. For her, it's probably five or six. We got to fly into Detroit, get a car service. That's an hour and a half down. So we're not there. So Vicki, thank God, comes every two hours, three days a week, and then so we know how she's doing and what's happening with her, right? Which is really, really important. And thank God for her wonderful neighbors. 
We have been thoroughly blessed from them. But you know, caregiving is even going to become a greater issue in this country as we age. So, what can the church do for caregivers? What kind of ministry possibilities are there there for that? An intergenerational ministry. I, I think for a lot of our churches, this is really the ticket, the idea with the adult daycare, but the idea intergenerational is bringing youth, children, and older adults together for learning and building relationships. And there's a lot of church can do with that. There's my, my, my text from Psalm 71. Oh God, from my youth you have taught me and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to your old age and gray hairs, oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might into another generation, your power to all those who will come. Here's the bottom line. We are never too old to share Jesus with people, are we? Not until that last breath and our spirit goes home with the Lord. We can make Christ known. Here, here's my great story. So, years ago this other pastor told me this story. He had, a, he had an aunt who lived on a farm in Iowa. And she always wanted to be a missionary. And she never could. Because... Her call, her vocation was to be on that farm, right? So, so one day he says, she calls him up and, and her health is gone, has to, gone down, so she has to go into a nursing home. And by the way, don't let anybody tell you that when people age, they automatically go into the care facility. Only 5%, only 5 to 6% of people actually have to go into a care facility when they get older. Face it, most of us want to stay in our homes, don't we? We want to age in place. So, one day, this guy's aunt calls him and says, so excited, I am finally a missionary. Finally a missionary. And he's saying, I don't understand. I mean, you're in this nursing home in Iowa. She, she said, well, come to find out in this nursing home. They had a lot of folks at work there. They were from, uh, they were from South America, and they were from Africa, and places like that. All right, Care. I know you're already doing a lot of these great things. Visitation, visitation, visitation. I'm old school pastor, which means I still go visit people. I still think that works. I think that's important, right? And I think for older adults, visitation is very important. Checking on people because, you know, how many times do you walk into a house of an older adult than I have? Maybe there's something different. Maybe the person looks thinner. Maybe they're disheveled. Maybe there are smells in the house, right? That gives us an indication that there's something going on with them. And they may need some further assistance. Visitation's important. Counseling and mental health, we talked about that earlier. Do you, do you realize... Do you realize it's really sad? You know what is one of the suicide in America? Everybody thinks it has to do with teens. Do you realize one of the suicide rates are men 65 and over? Men 65 and over, especially men who have focused on work their whole lives. And they retire and what's next? We see that a great deal. So mental health is really important. We talked about caregiving, caregiving and respite, maybe an adult day, adult, uh, you know, daycare. Um, anything with retirement planning and age. You know, one, one thing that, that I see all the time is when people age, I'm always surprised. Sometimes people don't plan at all. And I'm not even talking about the money aspect. I'm talking about planning as people age. Maybe we don't think we're going to age. And we don't plan for that, but things happen. And we knew a church can sponsor things like that. Helping to build relationships. Now, outreach. Outreach. So, in 1965, Lyndon Baines Johnson, when he was president, he signed into law something called the Older, um, Older Adult Americans Act in 1965. Now, why this was really important, by the way, Medicaid came in that section, Medicare came in that section too, pretty important. What the Older Adult Americans Act did is establish state agencies on aging, and then every region, city, county, or counties together had something called a AAA, which is called an Area Agency on Aging. 
And they are responsible in a county. Do you see senior centers? Do you see nutrition sites? Do you see transportation? They are responsible for all those. And why I lift that up that's really important is because as a church, we can contact our local AAA to see what the needs are of aging adults in our communities. And, hey, we got space. Can you use our buildings for a program? If you go to that website, www.n4a.org, and put in the zip code for Hartford County, it'll tell you exactly where the AAA is. I would urge you to contact them. They're a great source. Every, uh, every area that has, usually every county has their own human services. And everybody thinks human services, you automatically think about child protective services, which is really important, right? But another aspect of human services, they have something called APS, which stands for Adult Protective Services. Their job is to protect older adults, to make sure that their living conditions are okay, uh, um, see if they need to go to a care facility. But here's one of the biggest things that we see all the time that they work with. Elder abuse is on the rise. As bad as verbal and physical and emotional abuses, what do you think is right now is the worst form of elder abuse? Financial. Financial. In fact, I hear this all the time. Let me, let me share you a story from my own church. Sad. I had a woman that was a retired teacher. And uh, she was an active participant in our Saturday night worship. One day she came in to me. She says, the FBI is watching me and they're calling me. I said, why is that? It didn't make any sense, so she wouldn't give me any more, so I contacted, I said, something's not right here, right? Contacted the authorities, contacted APS, they wouldn't, she wouldn't let them in a the house. Well, come to find out, she got swindled over $300,000. Had to sell her house that was all paid for. Had to move into a retirement apartment. They found her again, swindled her out of more, and she was so distraught, she took a gun and she, she killed herself because of elder financial abuse. It is real, it is bad, and sad but true, it's usually a family member, a neighbor, a relative. Thankfully, states are passing laws now where banks and financial institutions, I had another situation the other day where it looked like a daughter was coming in and trying to swoop out and the financial person I know well called me and we were able to work that and stop that from happening. But I'm just telling you right now, it's really bad and it's usually financial. Any programs you can do on fraud, elder abuse, anything on fraud, really, really important. Um, hey, have you ever thought about having an adult vacation Bible school? You have one for children. Have you ever thought about an adult vacation Bible school? And do something with that? That's a possible idea. Lunch and learning. That's one of the first things we did when I went to Culpeper. We started a monthly lunch and learning where we would supply lunch and we'd get a speaker in. So what we did, we started a, um, a monthly lunch and learning where we brought a speaker in that had to do with senior issues. And that's where we got a lot of people from the community coming. And we could do outreach from that. That's just an idea. Support groups. I talked about them either. That's a great ministry for a church. Can we have a widow support group? Could we have a support group for caregivers? Could we have a grief support group? I got another one for you. How about a support group for children of aging parents? Children of aging parents, because sometimes as children, we now have to, uh, you know, care for more for our aging parents, right? That's just an idea. Anything we can do socially or recreationally, right? Hey, and guess what? We can reach out to older adults, invite them to worship. You know, in my congregation, I have some older adults who go to all the senior centers, and I love them, because when somebody new moves in, they, they, they go up to them and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, get to know them. Do you have a church do you go to? If not, why don't you come to mine? Because some of the best evangelism is done with, with mature adults. The sky is a limit to outreach to seniors. And the church can do that, can it? Just a thought. 
You know, years ago, somebody asked me what would a comprehensive senior ministry look like. I developed the five S's of senior adult ministry, spiritual, sharing, service, social, and self. You know, you can do ministry with any of those. Spiritual can be anything with studying the Word of God and worship and discipleship. Sharing is doing anything outreach. Obviously, service is reaching out in the church or using gifts in the community. Social is anything that you can do, anything recreational, going on trips and things. And self is maybe exercise or counseling or visitation. Here is the point. This, the country is aging, the world is aging, and the church is aging. Instead of us saying, look, an aging church means a deteriorating church in a dying church. Can't we say, look at the great opportunity that we have for ministry. Because if so many people are getting older, I will guarantee you they don't all know Jesus and they're not connected with the church. So why can't a big part of our ministry, as long as we reach out to the children and youth, which is very important, which I think we all should do, why can't we also reach out to middle age and older? Because I really believe that can bring renewal and revival to the church. Thoughts? Comments? Questions? What happens generally when you... Who present this to a congregation or to a ministry within the church? What, what's the reaction? Well, you know, they have allowed me to be on the staff for the NALC for five years, and I have slogged away with this. Five years ago, people just kind of brush me off and say, How does this work? You know, we need to bring in more children and youth. But I'm telling you right now, over the last year, I am getting so many more phone calls and emails and come speak. Because we see this in our congregation. So a lot of times in a congregation, when you lift this up, people might say, well, that's not going to help the church at all. Because we're still about children and youth. And I say, hey, I'm for children and youth too. But let's get real. If, if, if you have a church full of 75 or 100 people and most of them are gray-haired, right? Why can't we just say, maybe, maybe our ministry and mission is not for younger, but look at all the older that we have. You know, I like to use the expression, I, we're not here to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know that old expression, right? We are not here not to reach out to all people. But if we see our church, and it's really aging, and trust me, there are churches that are aging even f much faster than yours across the country. I say, why don't we look at this as a great ministry opportunity? People at first might shut you down and say it's not important, but then I say, look at the demographics of your church in the community and what's going to happen. That's a great question. So a lot of times I've gotten closed doors, sure, but I'm not giving up because the country's aging. Church is aging. It, it's inevitable, right? So the question is, are we going to be proactive now and reach out to the aging or are we just going to just let it go and are we just going to dwindle away and die? Because, because there's always change, isn't there? Whether we're open to change or whether it's going to take over us. Yes. What else do you got for me? Is there one common area that churches begin with? You know, I think, I'll tell you if, you, if you, if you were to ask me what I think one of the big areas is, it's the spiritual. Getting people in the word, growing in discipleship. Yes. You know, you can do, the great thing about older adult ministry, you can, you can put together a comprehensive ministry and you could do different things, right? At different times, you know. There, it's interesting because in the aging, think about it today. We don't even look at older today, maybe, maybe starting at 85. When you think about it, older. I mean older because there is this one guy, and by the way, I put this great book up here. I'd love for you to get that book. It's by a guy by the name of Richard Gensler. He started the whole aging ministry for the United Methodist Church years ago. He wrote this great book called The Age of Opportunity. It would be great for a congregation to read. 
and go through and use that as a guide. He used to say there are three types of older adults. He says the go-goes, the slow-goes, and the no-goes. <laughs> That's what he says in the book. The go-goes, the slow-goes, and the no-goes. Because as we age, people are going to be at different levels. And their needs are going to be different. For example, you know, there are different ways to look at aging. Some people do it chronologically. And, you know, chronologically is really not the best way to look at aging, is it? Because, trust me, when I was a seminary student, you know, I'd obviously God at Providence, because when I was in my first year seminary student, I was connected with a, a congregation because I went to seminary in Philadelphia. And I was connected with a congregation, and the pastor said, I want you to work with the seniors. Now, mind you, I am a 22-year-old guy, okay? So I'm working with the seniors, and I go, and there'd be 90-year-olds dancing around. And then I go back to the seminary, and these people in the 20 were laying around, and they were like slaws. You know, and I always thought to myself, isn't that a difference? Here's 90 or so full of energy and vibrancy, right? So I think... People are at different levels, so one way to look at aging is through chronology. Another way to look at aging is functionally, what can a person do at a particular age? And then the third area is my favorite, by attitude, or psychological. Because we know in aging, we don't ever want to give up, do we? We want to keep being active, we want to have a good attitude, and we want to keep developing those relationships. Yes. So. Other thoughts or comments? I just have a thought out there. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, some of the old timers that I have visited, yeah. friends, co-workers, they really enjoy a visit. Yes. It's a really big thing for them to have someone come. Yes. I agreed. I agree. You know, and that's part of the isolationism. You know, and the loneliness. It is. You know, I know you have a great Stevens ministry here. We have a Stevens ministry too. Because it's very vital. Very vital. We have, a, I, have a, I have some lay deacons and they also visit for me too. So we have a lot of people visiting. We really do. But yeah, anything, visitation, anything reaching out to people. Again, I know, I know in so many ways this concept of really reaching out to the middle age and older, it's foreign in the church. Because that's not how we were brought up, is it? We were always brought up children and youth and families. Agreed. I get that. But by the way, these stats that I give you, they're not Brad Hale's made up stats. These are from the U.S. Census Bureau. These are not made up stats. We are aging rapidly. So the question is, as the church, are we going to take, are we going to say, hey, aging can be a great mission field for us to share Jesus and invite people to get connected with the community or worship of the Lord? Or are we just going to say, well, the church is inevitably going to age and it's going to go down and it's going to die one day? Let me ask you a question. And I know, I know what the answer is because Pastor Jay has told me there are Lutheran churches around you in Baltimore that were probably here for over a hundred years. Are all those churches still here anymore in Baltimore? Nope. They died, didn't they? They died. They just aged out and died, right? It doesn't have to be that way, does it? It does not. I firmly believe it does not. If we have an aging we can reach out there, that can renew and revitalize the church. We're all getting older. We all need Jesus. We all need to grow in our faith. And in the church, a great place to make that happen. So I come to you today just to get you thinking. That's why I come. To get you thinking and get your thought process going and saying, look, what might a comprehensive aging ministry be here at Trinity Lutheran Church in Joppa, Maryland? And a part of that is middle age. By the way, Pastor G, I just wrote a, um, I just wrote a Bible study on, called the Middle Age Maze. On Middle Age, I'm going to send it to you. You can use whatever. Just for Middle Age. Because really, how we live in the Middle Age is a prelude to how we're going to age. 
to as we get older. So, but how do we define middle age right? Well, it's really interesting. I define it. You know, the old axiom was uh, the old axiom was uh, forty to sixty. I think it's later. I think you could start it at thirty-five. Because of, you know, how people are living. And you could easily, you know, if the biblical age is 120, you could either go up to 60 or 65. You know, it's almost like that's middle age. And then you have young older. And then you have older. I really think anything past 65 to all about 85 is what I would call young older. Hmm? I do. Because, you know, you know a lot of people that are 70, 75 that are really active, right? And doing all kinds of stuff. Yes. And it's going to be that way because medications and we're living longer in health care. So. But again, I come to have you think about the future. Other thoughts or comments? Well, you have been, thank you for your great attention. I really appreciate that. I hope, I hope it's been worthwhile to have me come and to share this to get you thinking. To get you thinking for the future. Yes, sir. Um, I think it's hard to imagine the average looks for this. I wonder whether that data was captured at the parking lot Sunday morning. <laughs> what about those people who don't drive? to the parking lot, to those who have access to the content. I know this church is doing great yes. you know, media ministry. Yes. And over there, you know, can't imagine decades ago you would have to take a whole TV crew to have what you did, this little seminar broadcasting to. You know, today, just FaceTime is there. You're right. YouTube channel live. So I was drawn to this, um, well, the school. Right, sure. Because the the content that was made of it, right. I remember it was the 2015. Uh, there was the, uh, back then was the Pastor Austin Jr. Mm -hmm. was delivered a whole series of seminar like this. Sure. But it was a round of elections. Sure. And I was a relatively newer mm -hmm. voter because mm -hmm. uh, I didn't acquire my citizenship after 9/11. Sure. But I remember I was struggling with. You know, I have been lived in New York for many years. Mm -hmm. I was struggling with Donald Trump, the mm -hmm. political leader, mm -hmm. versus Donald Trump, the mm -hmm. bankrupt businessman. Mm -hmm. You know, so that whole series really sure. helped me. So to you know, clear my mind and, and see things in perspective. So and that helped prompt us of looking into this school versus the original work that. You know, the uh, classical. Right, sure, right. Into the classical model. Mm -hmm. Right. And when I visited their open house, I don't see a vibrant church behind it to support it. Uh, so that's where we are. So I think the content is in True. what draws people. In True. Whatever the ministry of the. True. You know, I think you make a great point. I think for years in the church, we always just expected older adults to support the church. I did. I think we always expected they'd come to worship and they would give. I think, though, now we're saying, look, it's time to engage older adults in growing in their faith and discipleship. I agree with you 100%. Because I'm amazed. Uh, you know, I've worked with older adults, you know, now the last 30 years. I'm amazed when they say to me, Pastor, I've never learned so much about Jesus in the Bible. I mean, these are people who grew up in the church. They've been through confirmation. They've done all this and they don't know. And I think you're 100%. People are hungry. And are we going to give them food or not? Now, you know, here's, a, here's both the bad and downside of the COVID-19 for a lot of our churches. Most people that died during the pandemic were 65 and over. That's the bad side. You know what the good side was? Churches that were not live streaming <laughs> have to now. So people that are home, that maybe can't get out, there's an opportunity, isn't there? Than what we ever had before, because I'll tell you, there was probably a very low percentage of churches that were live streaming before COVID-19. Yes, I agree. We have to engage older adults. We have to engage middle-aged adults. That's the idea in engaging them in discipleship and growing and discussing. We do. 
We just can't take that group for granted. Yes. So my challenge is considering in the months and years ahead, how can this church, which is, which is a, a, a growing, vibrant Lutheran church, maybe the only one around Baltimore, right? How can we say, look, with all the great intergenerational things we're doing, how can we even intentionally reach out to middle-aged and older adults? Because we're getting older. And the community's getting older. So, other thoughts, comments? I'm here, I will always come back down or whatever you need from me. I'm close. So I can come. <laughs> Yep, sure. Yes. When uh, one of my daughters, or five daughters, hmm? uh, blends the family, when they ask me, what, what, can I, uh, what can I get you for your birthday? I said, I'd like you to go to church with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was that reaction? I just, well, great. A couple of them have. Sure, great. Great. I mean, one of them lives 100 miles away. So. Sure. <laughs> right. You know, here's the other thing, too. Don't invite yes please never guilt or force your older children when it comes to church yeah, just, and it doesn't work does it yeah let me, let me give you a bit of that yeah they, right yeah that it just sometimes gets them angry right but hey we'd like to invite you to this special thing that's something different right but again maybe as grandparents we can be that catalyst to get our grandkids to learn the faith and learn about Jesus you know, there's a whole other thing. Grandparent ministry, grandparent support groups, we've done that. Yes. Just have to put a hockey rate in. Yes, sir. In the past, church has been one approach fits all. Correct. But now today, you've got the methodology of ministering to the middle and old age. Ooh. Versus the completely different methodology of ministering to the teens and 20s and 30s. And how do you get one church to dichotomize their approach like that? Well, I think you, you bring the most important question of all as we end. You, what you do is you say in that intergenerational model, we have to do that today, don't we? We can't. Again, the one size fits all, we're going to do this way of evangelism, that model's old, isn't it? And it's not effective anymore. You know that old saying where they say, you know, you expect change, but you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting to change. We see it in many of our churches, they're declining, aren't they? And they're getting older. So I say, if we're having good youth ministry over here, that's great, isn't it? Why can't we reach out to older adults too? Why can't you do multiple things in a church? I think you can. I really do. Because if you have the staff and the volunteers to do that, you can do that. And we need to do that, don't we? Yeah. We can, you know, again, we can say, oh, the country's getting older. You know, the church is just going to keep going down. You see all these churches that are closed or declining in Baltimore. We don't have to take that attitude, do we? We can take this thing, you know, tiger by the tail and say, look, here's our opportunity, right? We have all of these kids. We're doing great youth ministry. Why can't we reach out to middle-aged and older adults and welcome all them in? I think that churches have to do that if they're going to continue to thrive and survive. The other problem is most of the older people have been in that church for a long time. True. And everybody assumes that they'll be there when they can feel okay to be there. Yes. I'm saying, too, there's a lot more older people on there that don't know Jesus oh, yeah. and, and are connected with the church. Yeah. That's what I find. So, again, this is a prime example. Reformation Lutheran Church in Culpeper last year had 30 new members. Outside of a couple of baptisms, guess what? All those people were 50 and over. Seeking. Looking. We certainly didn't turn them away, did we? Because they were 50 and 60 and 70, right? We said, come on in because they were looking for community. They wanted to connect with Jesus. That's my point, isn't it? Yes. 
So, my pleasure. Other thoughts, questions, comments? You, again, you've been great today. Thank you. Thank you for all your time and everything. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks.